My name is Margaret Lyons. I'm one of the yeah. I'm one of the co-founders of the Jukebox, and um, I really wanted to tell the story tonight. But the song that it's about is a really terrible karaoke song, which I learned from experience. So instead of doing karaoke, what's going to happen is I need everyone's help. Um, we're going to sing part of the chorus at various points in the story together. So when I go like this. We're all going to sing just a part of this chorus because one of the things that's bad about this song for karaoke is that it's really repetitive. So we're just going to go, whoa, oh, 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 oh. And we're only going to sing that part because it really just goes on and on. So can we all do it together? You ready? Whoa, oh, 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 oh. Yay. Uh, if there is a more dehumanizing place to contemplate one's failures than the American Airlines terminal at LaGuardia Airport, it is the Delta terminal at LaGuardia Airport, which is where I found myself on December 19th, 2008. That wasn't the worst day of my life, but it was top 10. I was flying from New York to Chicago, which is a flight I've done a million times, but what was different was this time, I lived in New York and I was only visiting Chicago. And I grew up here, but I'd lived in Chicago for eight years. And uh, I thought sort of career-wise and, and family-wise and maybe romance-wise, it was time to move back to New York. So I did in September. And then just a few months later, I was flying back to go visit my friends. And, you know, it was right before Christmas. Only a couple of months had passed, but as any college freshman can tell you, a lot can happen before Christmas break. <laughs> my flight was supposed to be at 10 a.m., and my dad insisted that I call the airline to make sure it was on time before we left the house. Oh, did I mention I was living with my parents at this time? I was living with my parents at this time. <laughs> I was 26 years old. <clears throat> uh, that flight, that original flight, was canceled, and that was the first time I cried that day. Whoa, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. But I took my chances on another flight, and I wound up with a bunch of time to sit in this Delta terminal praying to fucking take off. And that's when I started listening to Single Ladies. The song was pretty new at that point, and I'd only heard it once or twice, so I'm actually not really sure how I wound up putting it on the December 08 mix I pathetically made for myself. <laughs> uh, maybe God put it there. <laughs> Just kidding, there's no God, I found it on a blog. <laughs> I was on my way back to Chicago to see my friends and some of my favorite people and I was gonna put on a party dress and a smile and I was gonna lie to them and tell them that New York was going great. And I wasn't lonely and I wasn't heartbroken and things were gonna just be fantastic. But the thing about moving when you're a grown up is that no one gives a shit about you. So when you go to summer camp or when you go to college, everyone wants to make friends. But when you're a grown up and you're like, how come no one wants to get a beer? Or like, doesn't anyone want to go to Lowman's with me and tag team the clearance rack because I know your size and style pretty well? No, no one cares. Oh, I'm gonna spend a year talking to people, none of whom will ever know how I take my coffee, like, like you would do for your friend, like you know how your friends take your, their coffee? No, no one will know. You're gonna just have a year of strangers. The universe doesn't care. And I sat there and I, uh, <laughs> I was sort of contemplating how everything had just not gone according to plan. I was living with my parents, which I thought I would do for a few weeks and wound up doing for five months. But uh, it was great. I get along great with my parents. I love living with them. It's awesome. That's horrible, though, because it's <laughs> supposed to be like, oh, get me out of here, and not like, yay, free food and laundry. I'm staying forever. <laughs> You're supposed to be like, mom, I'm an adult. Like, I have independence. But instead, I was like, this is Fantastic. Uh, so I felt guilty about having a nice time. And then, professionally, things had really gotten off to the wrong, uh, off on the wrong foot. I thought initially when I got there in the fall that I was kind of lucky. I was going to fill in for the guy in New York who had my job in Chicago. He was on sick leave and it was the same pretty much stuff. And so I, I slotted in, sure, freelance. Um, he was on sick leave, but then he died. So then I'm like logging into the office computer network with a dead guy's password, and I'm sitting at a dead guy's desk, and I'm opening a dead guy's mail. And I was like, well, maybe this will at least lead to a full-time job? 
But then I got laid off in an email with the subject line, great news. <laughs> yeah. On my last day at that job, I had to set up the work email to forward to another coworker who is the guy who had dumped me a couple of weeks earlier saying, I love you and I dream about marrying you and you're my best friend, but I just can't see us dating. <laughs> I didn't need a flight to Chicago. I needed a time machine. So when this song came on the mix, I was like, okie doke, okie doke. And I just kept clicking back to it. What uh oh uh oh uh oh uh oh oh uh Now I grew up in New York, but I grew the fuck up in Chicago. And uh, when I was a kid I was like really miserable because I was in like a lonely nerd. And I sort of thought that like I could be smart or I could be happy or I could be myself or I could have friends, but I couldn't do everything at once. <laughs> And I didn't realize until I was living in Chicago that that really wasn't true. And so the geography of Chicago is the geography of my adult heart. There's the building where I deposited the first check I ever got for writing something. It was about how much I hate Kirstie Alley. <laughs> Check. Uh, there's the office building where I had to fill out my first life insurance thing and I was freaked out the whole day. There's the theater where I saw The Exorcist and thought my life would never go back to normal. There's where Pete told me that he loved me and I didn't say anything. And, and over there is where three years later I said it back, but I was too late. There's the bar with the best photo booth in the world where I have pictures of nervous first kisses and giggly vacations and where my best friend Evelyn and I exchanged Christmas gifts one year. She gave me a purse and I gave her a vibrator and we were both very happy. <laughs> There's the crappy dive bar where I took my friend the night she left her husband. That's the bar where I've been stood up. That's a bar I've been dumped in. And it's a bar where I used to like to play Dirty Scrabble with my friends where one night a guy was hitting on us and he leans over and looks at the table and he's like, hey, clit's not a word. <laughs> <laughs> that bar's called the Beachwood and I really recommend it if you're ever in Chicago. Uh, there's the apartment where I hosted my first grown-up dinner party and we all had so much fun that my roommate and I pulled our mattresses in the living room and everyone slept over in a goofy drunken dog pile, which is the difference between being an adult and being a fucking awesome adult. <laughs> there's the arena where I heard Barack Obama announce his candidacy where later that day, for the first time in my adult life, I was introduced to someone as my girlfriend, Margaret. There's the diner we went that night after the black tie party and you got ketchup on your only good dress shirt. There's the building where I had my first one night stand and there's the crappy Polish sausage place where I quit being a vegetarian after 10 years because well, we were here and why not and what was I waiting for? So I sat at this terminal and I sat there stewing in my own regret and my fear and I couldn't stop clicking back to the comforting gems of Beyonce Knowles, gloss on her hips, uh, gloss on her lips. <laughs> Man on her hips. They're tighter than her Darion jeans, you guys. Um, I wasn't so much in love with the song, although I obviously love that song, but I was just hoping for that sort of like Franny and Zoe moment of just having anything playing in a loop in the back of your head all the time, because what was playing in a loop in the back of my head all the time was, what were you thinking? And just anything other than that was a really, really fantastic choice. So when my flight finally took off at 10 p.m., which is 12 hours after I'd planned, 10 hours after I'd gotten to the airport, and seven hours after I had just put single ladies on repeat and <laughs> given up the ghost of pretending like I was listening to other things, just <laughs> strictly on repeat, uh, the flight finally took off. And, uh, and I did not turn off my electrical devices. I listened to that song the entire way to Chicago. I listened to it on the orange line from Midway <laughs> to the blue line to Logan Square. <laughs> And when my friend Heather picked me up, she looked right at me and she said, oh my God, how are you? And I told her the truth. And that was the third time I cried that day. Whoa, 